Welcome everyone, day two of the Dog Gut Health Summit. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor, and I'm your host of this incredible summit with Pet Summits. So if you're joining me live, I would love to hear where you're joining from. Drop it in the chat in that comment section where you're joining us live. And once again, we're on day two. Can you hardly believe it? We're halfway through the Gut Health Summit. Yesterday, we talked all about the talks from ranging about digestion and hair tissue tests, the microbiome, and different types of food and what different symptoms might mean. So if you missed our Q&A yesterday, make sure you watch the replay. It's definitely on the Pet Summit YouTube channel. And hey, everyone, I see you, Bryn. I see you from Montreal, two Clumber Spaniels from Australia, Bookie. Hey, good to see you again from Florida, T-Mac from Western North Carolina. Susan from Winnipeg. We have quite a few Canadians and an Australian. It's fantastic. Hi, Jeffrey from Michigan. It's really good to see you guys. I'm glad you're here joining live. Once again, this is for you guys. This is our live Q&As to go over the questions that you might have about your dog's gut health and anything that might have arisen from watching the talks, especially as you go through each of those talks. As a reminder, each of the talks each day is live for 48 hours. And if you're finding the information really, really valuable and helpful, there is definitely a link where you can upgrade to make sure that you're getting all of the replays that you can watch at any time. So make sure that you check that out. So that way you can get the premium package and watch whenever you need it because there's so much information. And I would love to, I see you guys, Ema, Lisa, JK, it's great to see you. Lisa Foster, fantastic. Jennifer, thank you for joining us live. First off, I would love to hear how have you found day two? If you found something helpful or you learned something new, drop a one in that comment section because I know that I've learned so much from listening to my colleagues, interviewing them, and there's a lot of things that we can implement or you may have found like uncovering like, wow, I never thought of that. That might be the key to helping my pet heal. I see you guys. I love it. I love that day two is helping you just as much as day one. If you haven't watched those talks, you still have 24 hours left to watch. It's kind of closing out. So definitely check that out. I see Lisa, 1111. That's an angel number. I love that. <laughs> so this is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you're finding the summit so far helpful. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a brief recap of some of the talks. So if you haven't yet watched them, we'll go through some of that. But first, I have to say a big thank you to our sponsors of this summit. And Fair Pet Organics is a great organic supplement company that I use personally. I recommend for my patients. I highly recommend checking them out. I actually know the owner personally. We did our acupuncture certification together years ago. So just kind of a random fact. And then also too, we're sponsored by Chi Dog. So Dr. Susan was on our kickoff call. If you missed that on Sunday, you can go back and rewatch that on the Pet Summit's YouTube channel. Um, the, the Chi Dog's fantastic. They're using a lightly cooked food based on food therapy, using the energetics of food. And Susan's talk yesterday shared a lot of information that you can use to help identify what pattern and constitution your pet may be if they're experiencing a gut health problem and how to pick and choose certain types of foods based on the energetic composition of that food. Very powerful healing modality that I use with my own patients too. And then of course, Innovative Pet Lab. They're a fantastic gut health company where you can actually order the stool test yourself and you can run that sample. You get an amazing report that showcases, do we have gut inflammation? Do we have leaky gut? Are we having a digestive issue? Is that immune system in the gut locally not working very well. So it can uncover areas where then you can pick the right supplements, the right foods to actually heal the problem because you know what you're treating. So definitely check out all the sponsors. They've graciously given everyone discounts too. Those links are also in the description and in the comment section. So highly recommend checking them out. I use every single one of the companies that sponsored us. Um, they're fantastic and I know, like, and trust them. So definitely check that out. Also too, each day you will receive 
receive an email with the links to the daily talks. So make sure you check that out. If you're not seeing it for some reason, check your spam just in case it went there, but it brings you right to the list of all the talks, making it super easy for you to watch them, whether you're working, don't tell your boss, or if you're working out or walking the dog or whatever it is, make sure you check those out and please share this information with your friends. So if you have a friend that has a dog that loves the holistic side or maybe not, is not even aware of this side of medicine, please share the link with them so that we can spread this knowledge and information so we can start planting those seeds so that we can help our pets thrive and live their best lives. So definitely check all those out. And we'll have two more days left of our Q&As. So make sure you join me live for tomorrow. And then also on Thursday, tomorrow I will be joined by a good friend and colleague. Um, so stay tuned for that, which will be fantastic. Now, day two was all about the gut microbiome. Let me know if you're live here or if you're watching the replay. Are you familiar with the microbiome? So you can put, if you're, you already know what the microbiome is, just drop a yes or a thumbs up. If you're like, this was a new concept, I wasn't even aware of how important this is. You can put a, like a, you can do a, like a thumbs up also, because it just probably opened up a whole new world for you. And I love you guys. You already are familiar with the microbiome. We've been talking about it for a very long time now. But as you can see, it plays a huge part for the rest of the body. And a lot of people and my veterinary colleagues may not be familiar with the microbiome studies and all the data coming out. So it's really important to share these talks also with your veterinarian so they can better understand of how it's interconnected with everything else and how maybe drugs and medications could be impairing or impacting the microbiome, making it potentially harder to heal your pet's symptoms and keep Keeping you stuck. So Dr. Connor Brady kicked off the day today we're talking about the GI tract and what does an optimal diet look like for dogs. If you don't have his book, Feeding Dogs, I highly, highly recommend it. There is a ton of research in there. I also always recommend gifting it to your veterinarian. We can plant those seeds and help them see some of the research also to help shift the mindset around dry processed food is best for our dogs and getting around the idea that a minimally processed food is much better for supporting overall health and also optimizing the microbiome. So he went through quite a few things. He's very entertaining. I highly recommend watching his talk if you did not check that out yet. Um, and then he is very knowledgeable and he knows what he's talking about. So if you haven't watched that, make sure you watch it. He talks about also to food labels and what some of the like descriptions and words mean too. And then of course gives you some tangible options for adding in fresh food. Now, Dr. Christina Chambro talked about glyphosate and how glyphosate can be this hidden danger, this hidden toxin that actually directly impacts the microbiome. So it works on a specific pathway of those microbes where it can actually kill them and we end up having a problem with diversity. We can end up with an overgrowth of bacteria. It can then lead to things like leaky gut or inflammation in the gut lining. And then it leads to inflammation in the body. And then that's when we see things like hot spots, ear infections, behavior problems, that gut brain connection we talked a little bit about last night on the Q&A. And it's a hidden danger. We don't see it. It's invisible. And we know that glyphosate is in 90% of the water in the world. So when it rains, we're most likely having glyphosate rain down on us. But here's the thing, and this is something that I always teach with my pet parents in my community, is that just because we might live in a toxic, well, we do live in a toxic environment, or you might be in a more toxic environment, it doesn't mean you need to be afraid because there's so many amazing tools that we can use to help open up detox pathways. We can bind to the glyphosate. So things like ion gut using humic and fulvic acid, which will bind to glyphosate to remove it are key components for helping your pet clear it. So it doesn't stay in the body and create all these adverse issues that once again, might be keeping you stuck with the gut health issue that your pet might be displaying. So definitely take a look at that because glyphosate is here. Unfortunately, it's here to stay. 
And because it's so used, widely used and widespread in our agricultural system, a lot of the foods that we're feeding are going to be higher in glyphosate. So there's a lot of testing you can do. Um, there's also ways, like I mentioned, for you to bind that, to get it out. But it's very important, and we can't dismiss the impact that it can have on our dog's microbiome. And then we heard from Dr. Margot Roman about understanding the microbiome restorative therapy and how it supports the healing process. And so another name for this would be fecal transplant. Who here has used fecal transplant capsules or done a fecal enema with their dog? This is becoming more and more common. Let me know in the chat if you've used this for your dog and how it worked and how it helped them, um, because that'll show also other pet parents who are a little bit weary or they're like, I don't know about this. This is kind of crazy. It can be really, really beneficial for getting the microbes back into that gut, especially when we have dysbiosis or an overgrowth of bad bacteria. Um, so it's definitely one of those things where it is very beneficial. I see you, Lisa, with like IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. It's used commonly on the human realm for Clostridium difficile, which is a very severe gut infection. I have personal experience with that in my husband who has IBD uh, years ago. It almost killed him. So it's a very serious condition, but it's being used. Your fecal gut restore, your fecal transplants, your enemas are being used in the human realm for that. But there's a lot of different applications to help heal that gut and heal it faster. So it's definitely worth walk, looking into that, listening to Dr. Um, Margot Roman talk about the benefits of it. She's also, uh, she utilizes a lot of ozone therapy to help clear out biofilms. Those biofilms can kind of build up in the gut lining and it can trap toxins and bacteria and prevent that fecal gut transplant from sticking and doing what we want it to. So that's something to be aware of. Highly recommend watching that talk. And then we heard from Dr. Betsy Redman. Dr. Redman is part of Innovative Pet Lab. She was also part of our kickoff uh, conversation at the beginning of the summit. And she talked about beyond the microbiome because with the, the microbiome testing from animal biome that's come out, there hasn't been a lot of functional medicine tests that showcase how the gut works and what's going on at the gut lining level. So not at the microbe level. And so she talks about what's beyond that microbiome and how we need to better understand what's happening with digestion, what's happening with the gut lining. That's going to impact how well nutrients are broken down and absorbed from your pet's food. So this is to all the, the, the pet parents feeding a raw food diet and you haven't seen a change in your pet's health. And you're like, why is it not working for my dog? Crazy, right? Who here has been there? Drop a two if you're feeding a raw food diet and you're like, why am I not getting the results? that you've seen other people get in like other Facebook groups or other communities. It's frustrating. It could be because we have a gut lining issue, a leaky gut problem, a lower or overstimulated immune system that's not allowing the body to heal. And the food you're feeding is great, but it's if it's not being digested and absorbed through that gut lining, then we have major issues. So Dr. Redman goes into all of those factors and really how to adjust that based on test results too. So then you better understand what might be holding you back. And I see you, Susan. Um, this is very common. A raw food diet does not fix everyone. And if you're stuck, it's much more common than people realize. And it's because there's other factors, there's other root causes that haven't been uncovered that we need to dive deeper into. And now I'm super grateful we have a lot more functional medicine tests versus just the conventional tests and the blood work that's done at the vet clinic when you go in that can showcase where some of these deficiencies or excesses or excess inflammation are so we can pinpoint and actually treat the real cause versus just guessing and throwing the entire kitchen sink at it and ending up with a supplement graveyard. Thumbs down for supplement graveyards. They're expensive. They're not fun. They're frustrating. Uh, no one likes a supplement graveyard. Now, our final talk was with Dr. Gary Richter. And what were the risks to dogs that don't have a healthy gut microbiome? 
And this is where really understanding kind of this invisible world of the gut microbiome and the connections to other areas of health. Because we don't always think about the gut when we have an ear problem or when our dog is chewing on the paw. And if we're using things like Cytopoint injections or Apoquel or steroids, there can be a time and a place for quality of life and bringing that itchiness down. But there's usually some type of gut health component or the immune system connection with the gut because 70% of the immune system is closely and intimately connected with the gut. So we definitely need to step back and make sure we're not missing the forest for the trees when we are treating and looking at symptoms. And I always say, ask the question, why is that there? So definitely check out Dr. Richter's talk um, to make sure we're not overlooking certain components that could be keeping you stuck. So those were all the talks. I hope you get through all of that information and that knowledge. And once again, uh, there are definitely packages you can purchase to make sure you can rewatch all of the information so you can check those out. But I'd love to get into the questions because I know a lot of questions can come up, especially when you're dealing with a gut health issue or skin problem or a pet health problem. And when you start learning, you're like, wait a second, am I missing something? What's going on? Tell me more, I'm not sure what to do. So let's get into some of those questions. All right, Bryn, for dog GI issues, wouldn't it be better to feed ancient grain raw mix such as open farm with barley, brown rice, quinoa, or over, grain, over a grain-free diet? This is a great question. This is a huge controversial issue. I'm going to say this first up front. I know this is not Vryn's question, but grain-free diets do not lead to DCM, which is dilated cardiomyopathy or a heart condition. This is a myth that won't die um, and it has been disproven, but here's the problem. A lot of the foods that did lead to a potential heart issue with our dogs, and this is why this myth stays around, are really high in lentils and peas versus protein. And those are not high in taurine. So keep that in mind. So if you hear your vet say, don't feed a grain-free diet, you're going to cause a heart issue. We have to look at what's in that food and understand, okay, is it high in taurine? Yes. Protein, high protein is high taurine. Now to answer Vren's question, should we be using a lot more grains? Now each pet is an individual. And when we look at what are our dogs, our dogs are not obligate carnivores like a cat, but they are carnivores. They have evolved with some element of digestive enzymes, a little bit of salivary amylase to help break down carbohydrates, but they don't do well like we do as omnivores with a high carbohydrate diet. They're just not made to digest that food very well. So if we're looking at the types of diets, an open farm is a brand that I do not have any issues with, and there's different types of diets in open farm. Um, that are going to be more minimally processed all the way up to things like a kibble diet. Now, kibble has to be high carb. That is how everything sticks together and how it's extruded and processed. And we know that that is not a species appropriate diet. Now, in terms of looking at our carbs versus protein concentrations, we need some fiber. We need potentially a little bit of carbs. We can use it from a food therapy perspective, but it should ideally not be going over 25, 30% of the diet. And that's a higher mark for a lot of raw fed pets here. Um, but there is a time and a place and some pets do better with a higher carbohydrate content, which can come from your ancient grains, as long as your pet is tolerating it and they don't have a food sensitivity to it. So this is where seeing like, how does my dog feel? What does their stool look like? If you can do a microbiome test, great. Make sure that we have good diversity, that we don't have an overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria like E. coli or Clostridium are really important. Some dogs will do better with what we call low residue diets, which are gonna be lower fiber lower carbohydrate. I always say get away from your processed diets. I'm not a fan of kibble. Um, for numerous reasons, we do have a free guide. We have a simple guide to improving your pet's food um, at the natural pet doctor. And also a lot of you have downloaded it through the summit. 
um, where I list out the brands that are highly recommended and other resources too, to continue to learn about nutrition. So you can make sure you're feeding an optimized diet for your dog's gut health. So this is not a straightforward answer. This is where you sometimes have to be the scientist for your dog to make sure that we are looking at them, assessing them, and seeing what do they feel best with? What does their stool look like? So keeping a journal is really important. All right. Stacy, anxious, fear-reactive dog a few years ago. Purina Calm Care Probiotic actually worked. We no longer use, but want recommendations for probiotic brands. My question is always, why are we using a probiotic? So just because probiotics seem like they fix everything, we always have to ask, why are we using a supplement? So we have anxiety. First, I would want to fix the gut health. A probiotic by itself is not going to fix your issues. We have the gut-brain connection, so the gut-brain access through the vagus nerve. Um, a lot of times these anxious pets or hyper-reactive pets are going to have what we call brain on fire or neuroinflammation. We have to calm down that inflammation. And this is where things like medicinal mushrooms, CBD, uh, there's a lot of products we can use to help calm down that inflammation naturally, but we need to make sure that the microbiome is optimized in the first place. Now, some of these probiotics, like the Calming Care Purina product, um, for one, I'm not a huge fan of the Purina brand. They add a lot of synthetics into it, and there's a huge concern going on right now in the world around and a lot of recalls in the past with the company over potential synthetic vitamin mineral issues and where they're sourced and heavy metals and excesses and all those things. So I, I want you to think about what is in this and be reading those labels, because if you're seeing ingredients that are outside of, say, bifidobacterium longum, which has numerous research articles about the the you know the gut brain access and how it re helps calm the pet and how it works to calm that nervous system um we need to be thinking about why is that in there right because we don't want more synthetic vitamins and minerals going into our pets the other factor too which we talked a lot about last night is that the hyper reactivity the anxiety can be a heavy metal issue i just got some hair tissue mineral analysis results from a couple clients who were experiencing anxiety but also experiencing allergies and itchiness the problem is not an allergy it's actually a heavy metal issue and the aluminum is too high in the body and aluminum is going to increase inflammation. It also crosses the blood brain barrier. So doing a hair tissue mineral analysis test is really, really important. We offer those. So you can go to our website, you can get that done, get a better idea. Once again, I believe in testing to better understand why we're using certain things. So definitely look into that. Um, Dr. Ava Frick yesterday talked about it. There's a lot of companies out there um, that do run these hair tissue mineral analysis tests, they are very beneficial. So versus reaching for another probiotic, I want you to be asking why is that symptom there? What are the systems that are interconnected? And we need to be looking at a deeper level. So once we finish that probiotic, and if the symptom came back, it was kind of like putting a Band-Aid on it. So keep that in mind when you're looking at that. Um, next question. Okay, Stacey, why does my dog want to eat charcoal from the wood stove hearth self-medicating? Definitely could be activated charcoal if there's toxins. Um, it's a great detoxification. I don't know if I'd recommend eating charcoal from that. Um, I would prefer a more clean product. Uh, but we talked a lot about the different types of detox pathways that are closely connected to the gut. And if your pet's experiencing, you know, pets are really good at self-selecting. Um, certain things. Obviously, they don't get it right every time. That's why like keeping chocolate out or, you know, we don't want them eating chocolate. They'll eat certain things that they shouldn't that are toxic to them. But if you're noticing like they're eating a lot of grass or they're self-selecting charcoal, we have to ask, is there a detox issue that we need to address? If they're eating their poop, I'd be thinking, is there a microbiome issue? And they're self-selecting like a food source that's pre-digested, super gross, right? But 
that's can be a like that can be part of the reason why they're eating their stool or other dog's stool or things like that. So there's always a reason why they're doing something. So I think it's great that you're looking at that. And maybe it's time to use something like ion gut to support and heal the tight junctions, get potential glyphosate out of the body um, and use like it's a nice gentle binder versus and see if your pet stops trying to get to the charcoal in the fireplace. Next question. Kathy, if gut is okay, but skin may be an issue or allergies, can it still be related? So my question is always, okay, what have we done to identify is the gut okay? Um, so just because we don't have like loose stool or vomiting um, doesn't mean that we don't have a gut health issue. I've seen a lot of things come back on these tests where we were dealing with allergies and they had a dysbiosis, they had an overgrowth of E. coli in their, their pet's microbiome. Um, but also too, I'd be looking at, do we have leaky gut? So if we have leaky gut, and this is where Innovative Pet Labs tests can be really helpful to see is calprotectin, which is a marker of inflammation in that, in that gut lining. So if we get inflammation, there should be nice tight junctions. It starts separating food, bacteria, toxins pass through. It overstimulates the immune system. And then that's when we see because of the circulation and an overreactive immune system, we see inflammation in the skin. If we have a detox issue, there's too many toxins from things like heavy metals. This can also show up as itchy skin too. So this is where if you haven't done a hair tissue test, I would definitely start there. I would look at Innovative Pet Labs tests. Also, NutriScan is who I use for food sensitivities because I like seeing uh, the different immunoglobulin markers. I find that to be really helpful. Um, and this is where each vet will have their personal differences and opinions and preferences. So some of my preferences might be different from some of the other people that are other colleagues that you hear giving talks during this these four days together. So keep that in mind. And it's based on my personal experience, what I see work with my patients, especially when I'm dealing with a lot of gut and skin issues. So NutriScan is my go-to for food sensitivity testing. I find sometimes some of the other types of testing that are out there testing on hair, not the hair tissue mineral analysis test, which is looking at like vitamins, minerals, heavy metals, not food sensitivities, can be quite overwhelming because they come back with all sorts of random things and you're pet sensitive to everything online. Life, and then you're afraid to feed everything. And our energetic frequency decreases. And it's like everything now becomes an issue. And there's so much fear. And I don't feel like that's a healing energy. So the tests that I use give me kind of more clear understanding of where those gaps and those holes are so we can heal it. So those would be some of the things that I would be looking at. But like what I just mentioned with those hair tissue tests, with some of the patients that I've been treating, they didn't have allergies. They had way too high heavy metals. And that was what was creating the itchiness because the detox system was all backed up and we needed to open up those pathways, support digestion, support bile production. So those toxins could actually get out of the body and we can get inflammation down, detoxification goes up and starts working. Um, so there's interconnections with everything. So that's where I look when I'm when I'm working with a dog that has allergies and their gut seems pretty good. So I hope that helps. Next question. TMAC, Dr. Brady said that since dogs are carnivores, their digestive system is very acidic. That is correct. Does that explain why some dogs that eat kibble have reflux regurgitate because what they eat doesn't require high acid? Um, I would say that, that there's a lot of reasons why dogs have issues with kibble. And then there's dogs that like never have an issue with kibble. And that's part of the argument that we see. Um, now our, our dogs do have acidic environments in their stomach. And a lot of times their stomach pH is not low enough to activate digestive enzymes. And so when we feed a kibble diet, it requires a lot of digestive enzymes because it's higher carb and our dogs are not made for that. It's also processed at really high heat temperatures. And so it's forming a lot of byproducts that increase inflammation, things like advanced glycation end products. This is a form of like oxidative stress, increased inflammation in the body. So it makes it so much harder for dogs to process those types of foods. I see dogs that are eating raw food diets that get acid reflux. 
So just because once again, we're feeding a minimally processed diet doesn't mean that we don't have, we can, we won't have other potential issues, but kibble is a very highly processed, high heat. It's cooked at very high heat temperatures. A lot of those kibbles, I would say the majority of them are going to use your synthetic vitamins and minerals too. And those are not as well absorbed also. And so for slowing down the transition from the stomach into the small intestine, this can also lead to things like acid reflux. Or if we don't have enough stomach acid to break that down, um, we, we will have inflammation and potential issues too. So there's a lot of factors that come into play when we're looking at acid reflux and regurgitation. Once again, I'm a big fan of minimally processed diets. Even if it doesn't resolve the problem, you're removing the resistance of healing for your pets. So I always hear, well, I should just go back to kibble. They were doing so much better. Hold on a sec. Like if we're feeding raw, maybe we need to go to a lightly cooked. That's going to be more easily digestible for potentially older pets, uh, pets where their spleen, which is digestion in Chinese medicine, isn't working as well. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, but I would never recommend going back to a kibble diet because of all the ingredients that are in it. And it's going to make things harder for you and potentially create other health issues down the road. So I hope that helps. All right, Lori. If we followed all the ideal feeding cleaning protocols discussed successful, discuss, <laughs> discussed successfully for years, yet have a leaky gut signal, persistent dermatitis, um, even after several months of Chinese herbs and various topical cleansers, what is the next best step? Microbiome testing is not an option financially at this time. So this is really hard to say what exactly has been done. Um, it's great that you are reducing, hopefully this is the first phase is remove. So removing toxins as best as you can. My question is always, how are we supporting detox pathways too? So it's not just removing we have to start repairing also, replacing. Um, so there's a lot of factors here, it's hard to say, but I follow those five R's that we talked about yesterday with uh, um, um, Ruth Roberts, Dr. Ruth Roberts talked about it. I teach it in my Better Gut Health program. Following certain frameworks is key because a lot of things can be missed. And so if you can't do the testing, you know, we need to make sure that we are digesting the food properly, because if we're not digesting the food and we're lacking digestive enzymes, um, we need to make sure we're supporting an optimal pH of the stomach. So this is where I use a lot of standard process supplements. There are other products also, but using things that contain things like betaine hydrochloride, um, reducing that stomach pH to activate pepsin, activate the pancreas to produce digestive enzymes, adding in a digestive enzyme also um, to help break down that food. Because if food's not being broken down and it's getting to say the small intestine or the large intestine, and we potentially have a leaky gut, now we have high, like bigger food particles that haven't been broken down into your fats and your amino acids. And they're still like in a protein size, they pass through and the immune system goes, hold on a sec. This is foreign. And now that immune system goes into attack mode. And that's what increases inflammation. So once again, we don't know if we have heavy metals, but a lot of the detox protocols, making sure we're using milk thistle, burdock root, that we're on a well-balanced diet, that we're breaking down that food. Then we're also using binders to help clear things out. And we're supporting the immune system. So this is where colostrum, raw goat's milk can potentially help too if your pet isn't sensitive to those things. I like using things, being careful about what we're using topically too. I find a lot of the chemicals out there contain things like chlorhexidine and are really harsh to the skin microbiome and don't allow the skin to heal. The other thing I was going to say too is your omega-3s a lot of times are deficient. And this is where pasture-raised meats, if you can buy pasture-raised, ideally grass-finished, um, they're going to have a natural higher omega-3 ratio. And a lot of times you don't have to supplement with omega-3s. This is like Green Juju is a brand that does a lot of research. Billy Hochman talks a lot about this. Um, so if we can use these foods that work with the body, that have higher natural nutrient content, then we can actually reduce the amount of supplements we use because we don't need to add more. So I'd be following some of those principles and taking a look at, well, you know, it feels like I've done everything, but maybe I haven't adjusted this. Let me try this. 
do it long enough to get, see results. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so if we've been dealing with years of health issues, there is a journey. There are some ups and downs. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is not working. As long as you're seeing an upward progression through those downs and your pet is responding faster, they're recovering faster, that is a key component and something that keeps people stuck a lot of times. Okay. TMAC. Dr. Dubai suggested feeding one meal a day. What about dogs with stomach motility issues? Every dog is an individual. There are some dogs that need to be fed multiple times a day. So this is where if you are seeing your dog does better with multiple times a day, then stick with that. I, I am a fan of, I think we talked about it yesterday. There are so many extremes, right? Like we flip from one end to the other end of the spectrum, the magic's in the middle. You know your dog the best. And this is where, yes, there's a lot of information around intermittent fasting and allowing the cleansing waves to go through. And I can understand that. But if your dog is a dog that has bilious vomiting or they don't do well or they have some other medical conditions, it is okay to do feedings more than once a day. So keep that in mind. I'm giving you permission. It's okay. So I hope that helps. And I hope that reduces some of the stress that some of these like, I'm not saying it's wrong, but when we look at extremes, a lot of times those extremes work really well for certain pets and they don't work for some other pets because every pet is an individual and every environment is different. You know your pet the best and trust yourself with that. Next question. Cheviots, no diarrhea, but dog wants to eat dirt. Is it okay to let them or discourage? That is a symptom that is showing you there is a gut health issue. So they're eating dirt because they're trying to get vitamins and minerals. There's probably a microbiome issue. I would want to know what type of food are we feeding? Um, that is a common behavior. It is not a normal behavior. And when I think about the dirt, for one, like, is there things being sprayed in it? Are your neighbors spraying herbicides, pesticides? Like there can be a lot of stuff in there that could potentially cause more issues, more inflammation and health problems. Um, so if you can, once again, testing can help. If you can't do testing, this is where make sure that we're feeding um, minimally processed foods. If we need to add digestive enzymes and things like that, try that to help break down those foods, making sure we're adding in variety also. Um, those would be some of the, the, the steps I would start with when I see that type of behavior. Next question. What sort of food enzymes do you give to a dog? You guys are going to hate me tonight. I'm going to say, depends. <laughs> what are they eating? So this is where there's a lot of different digestive enzymes. And I use human digestive enzymes. There's me being transparent with everyone, not for every pet. But when I do, it's usually if a dog is on a higher carb diet, because your human digestive enzymes for one, are usually going to contain, be hypoallergenic. So I work with a lot of really sensitive pets. Um, so they can't tolerate a lot of things like flavorings and things added into a lot of the pet supplements. And if they're on a higher carb diet, for whatever reason it is, we need to make sure that they're able to break down that food. So if we're using a higher carb diet, like kibble, or you're using something that has higher carbs, like rice or a lot of, I mean, you'll see this with the ingredient list. Um, you want to be using more digestive enzymes to break that down. Now, if you're feeding a raw food diet, you don't need all of that. We still want some greens in there. We still need fiber to feed the microbiome. That is a really important prebiotic. But this is where things like there's a company called Optigest. Super simple. There's four digestive enzymes. Um, Dr. Mercola, which is now called Bark and Whisker, um, they have a digestive enzyme that I can't remember that it might be digestive enzymes. I can't remember the actual name, the new name for it. That is more geared towards a kibble fed pet because it has a broader spectrum of digestive enzymes. So we have to look at your pet as an individual. What are we feeding them? What are the circumstances around that? And what is this supplement doing to help them? Because just because there's a supplement choice doesn't mean we need to give it. That's really, really important. So I hope that helps. All right. A toy poodle who's itchy on Apoquel, I'm guessing Caddy, um, Cytopoint injections, eats Royal Canin, mature can, mostly blind, but otherwise healthy. Is he too old to switch him over to a new diet? This is where going slow 
and being careful. If you have someone to partner with, fantastic. Um, but also too, with an older pet, um, if you haven't watched Dr. Susan's talk from yesterday on food therapy, I highly recommend it. This is where I would not transition to like jump straight to a raw food diet because this animal has health concerns. They're older. We'd probably want to look at, I don't know what supplements they're taking. We need to build up strength. We need to support that digestion. A lot of times adding in a digestive enzyme to help them break down the food and then slowly transitioning them over to a lightly cooked or more minimally processed food. That's how I would approach that with an older animal going slow and steady um, and making sure we're supporting the different systems in the body is key. All right, next question. Rice, <laughs> good old rice, <laughs> the bad rap. I was always under the impression that brown rice when fed regularly has a higher burden of arsenic associated. What are your thoughts on it as the carbohydrate in dog food? Okay, so there's different viewpoints on this as there is everything, right? Which makes it super complicating for health. Can I get an amen for that? Anyone else like, oh, Jesus, why is there so much, right? Drop a three if you feel that way, because I, I can totally relate to you. And it's so confusing um, in the pet world, in the human world, especially when you start looking at integrative medicine. This is where brown rice can traditionally be higher in arsenic. I don't always see that reflected on hair tissue mineral analysis tests where we're actually testing for arsenic. Now, keep in mind, heavy metals can be hidden in the body. So we don't always see you guys dropping those threes. I'm, I totally get it. I get you. Um, and here's the thing. From a Chinese medicine perspective, it can actually be really helpful for a lot of conditions because of the energetic components of brown rice. Um, it is also a cheaper carbohydrate too. So a lot of companies will use that as the carbohydrate. Um, it's a good fiber source, um, depending on how it's processed, it can be provide additional nutrients. So there are pros and cons to it, just like everything else. Um, I don't use a lot of rice um, when I am formulating diets. I find it sometimes is, well, I treat a lot of skin health issues too, and it triggers pets. It can flare things up. It doesn't necessarily mean they have yeast. Not everything is yeast, by the way. But a lot of those pets do better with lower carb diets, so that lower residue. So I don't use a lot of rice in my practice for diets. But a lot of pets do, they can do well on it. Um, I would be tracking your hair tissue test every single year to make sure your arsenic levels are not rising, though. So something to be aware of because it can be, a, it is a real concern, um, your rice. All right, next question. Sam, my poodle often once a fortnight does yellow foamy bile vomits. He's raw fed and does well on that. Should I feed minces or chunks? I feed twice a day and I don't think I could do fasting. Okay, so this is where it's, so once a fortnight, so we have a pattern. My question would be, so I'm always looking for patterns. Like what's changing around two weeks time um, are we feeding at the same time of day, which can also potentially aggravate some of these pets with what we call bilious vomiting? Are we supporting detoxification and digestion? So I sound like a broken record, but this is where feeding mints or chunks may not make a difference. You can try it. Remember, you are the researcher. You can experiment with your pet to see what works well for them, keeping a journal. So if we're seeing an every two week pattern, I would also wanna know what's going on in the household emotionally. Is there something changing with routine? Something else happening? Like for example, what I, used, what I am super aware of now is when I see people spray things, right? Or, Beautiful Fort Collins will fog our city for mosquitoes. Thank you, Fort Collins, for that. You are greatly appreciated. That's complete sarcasm. I always watch my cats very closely. Uh, they are mainly indoors. One of our cats will go outside in the garden with us. But if I see any like sneezing or anything like that, I want to know, is there a pattern? But also, too, it can tell you if you need to support things like detoxification more. Um, so definitely track those patterns mean something. So track the emotional health, track what does their stool look like? Are we changing the protein? Are there other things going on um, that we may need to address? We may need to focus on adrenal health and calming down the nervous system. 
if they're like building up to a level where now we've reached the cliff and we've fallen off the cliff and the symptom that they show is bilious vomiting, uh, we may need to take a couple steps back. Um, so there's a lot of information there where we definitely would want to look at that um, to make sure that they're doing well um, and that we're supporting all those interconnected systems. Um, Lisa, chunks are better. I've seen pets sometimes do better with a more processed food. It just depends. Each pet is different. Um, so if you hear one thing, it doesn't mean that it's always the truth for every pet. Um, keep in mind, every pet is an individual. All right, next question. What tests do you recommend for allergy testing? Depends on what we're doing. Um, so if we're looking for food sensitivities, Nutriscan is what I use. So Dr. Gene Dodds, Hemopet is what I use. If you're looking for allergy testing um, with your veterinarian, we actually have a YouTube video on our Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor channel that distinguishes between allergies and sensitivities. They are not the same thing. Food allergies are very rare. These are things where you think about like a peanut allergy, where you eat a peanut, you it's anaphylactic reaction. It is a very severe allergy. It can cause death. Food allergies are very rare for our pets. And a lot of the blood tests that are done with conventional vets, they're looking at environmental sensitivities and also food allergies. I find the food allergy test is usually a waste of time. So I do the food sensitivity test that is looking at different immunoglobulin markers in the body with Dr. Gene Dodds. So that's the difference there. I highly recommend watching that video though, so you can get a better idea um, of what that looks like. The environmental sensitivities is a real thing. And I always recommend with environmental sensitivities, if we're concerned that there's like a seasonal pattern, this is where my the concern over environmental allergies goes higher. We are like every spring, they have an issue. Now there can be a Chinese medicine element too, but if that immune system's overreacting, there are a lot of things that we can do to help calm it down, um, to make sure you know the inflammation is as low as possible. But there's also environment, there's environmental allergy serum that you can use too. It works in about 70% of pets to desensitize them. There's mixed opinions about it. I've seen it help pets that have very severe allergies. It helps reduce the resistance. It doesn't mean we don't do the other things to help heal the body. I'd also be looking at microbiome testing through animal biome. I'd be looking at innovative pet lab. Um, I'd be making sure we don't have a thyroid issue that's commonly missed. So checking a, at least a T4, if you can run a full thyroid panel, those can be done through Michigan State through your regular vet. They can also be done through Hemopet also. So it's the same company that also does your saliva test. So we want to look at those. Um, if you can do all the tests, great. I know it can add up to a lot of expense, but if you're getting stuck and you've like been dealing with things for years and years, I mean, the cost of that adds up. So if you can space out those tests, this is also where hair tissue tests, making sure there's not a copper excess, a, a heavy metal excess. Those are all key components. They tell us different things. Um, so you have a better idea of what to actually treat. Um, and animal biome ships to a lot of countries overseas. So if you're in Canada, they ship to you. You would just go to the animal biome website. So um, you can definitely utilize them. But I've had clients, Singapore clients use Animal Biome. Uh, they ship worldwide, um, which is fantastic. And it's a stool test. So you can always reach out to them. But I know they ship to Canada. All right, next question. Do you do leaky gut tests first or the allergy tests first? Uh, it depends on what's going on with the pet. Um, usually I'm going to make sure we've ruled out a thyroid issue. Um, I'm also going to look at a microbiome test. And then if we can, that's when I'm doing an innovative pet lab test because they're testing different things. Um, but if we have like a dysbiosis or a lack of diversity, we need to address that first. And then we also need to make sure um, that there's not hormonal issues too that are creating a problem. I do hair tissue tests with my clients first off anyways, because it's so powerful and it helps guide. Um, so that's just part of the protocols I use. Um, with my patients also to make sure that we're going all in with detoxification along with the microbiome and gut health support. Um, or if we can hold off a little bit, go light, 
and then fix like the leaky gut. So it just depends on the pet and what they're experiencing. Environmental allergy test is definitely lower on my list now. I used to run it all the time before I had all these functional medicine tests and before I switched into like the integrative world. So there is a time and a place, um, but it's usually not the first test that I'm recommending. If we're having constant issues with like constant skin issues or constantly chewing at their feet, we're constantly getting ear infections. This is where I'd be looking also at NutriScan because if you're feeding a food, even if you're using an elimination diet trial, so that's typically like a eight to 12 week period of using a novel protein, we may end up picking a protein, even though it's like your pet has never potentially been exposed to it, that they're sensitive to. And it just makes the process easier and faster if you have a better idea of what your pet's sensitive to so you can avoid it. Okay, next question. Three-year-old Jack Russell Terrier with stools that often have a mucus enclosure. Where would you start to find the problem? Sometimes diarrhea, but sporadic. Everywhere, everything we're talking about. So exactly what I just talked about. We need to look at the gut. Um, and mucus is a sign that we have irritation in the colon. That's what that tells me is that the body is trying to expel things. So also too, making sure that we don't have a parasite problem or a Giardia problem. This is a simple stool test that you can take to your veterinarian and have them check to make sure that we don't have a complicating factor where the body's just aggravated, it's irritated, that colon, that intestinal tract is trying to expel um, the pathogen. So you know, starting with that test, making sure we're ruling out very common things that our dogs and Giardia is everywhere. Um, and if the gut health is weak, then that's where Giardia can set up house rather than being passed through. Um, so I'd be looking at what's the diet. This is where you don't necessarily have to do the testing right away, but what's the diet? How is my pet feeling? Are they anxious? Do we have a lot of stress? Because there's certain things you can do. I use a lot of teas with my, my dog patients. Chamomile tea is really great for calming down those adrenals, calming down a sympathetic nervous system overdrive. It, it calms down inflammation in the gut. It's anti-anxiety. I always say, have a cup of tea with your dog. You can put it in their food. Most of the time they will eat their food with the tea in it. And you're not going to overdose your dog on tea. It is a very gentle way to introduce herbs to your dog. Now I'm talking about brewing a cup of tea, letting it cool, remove the tea bag and using the liquid. Um, so you're not opening the tea bag and putting the herbs in there. Um, but that can be really helpful too. Very simple, uh, very cheap. Um, and have a cup of tea with your pet and just embrace it. <laughs> right. Awesome. Next question. Uh, Terry, any suggestions for reflex symptoms, hydrolyzed food, fecal transplant, Amiprazole, probiotics, ion gut has had endoscopies, biopsies, diagnosed with IBD, Chinese herbs. I can't give specific recommendations, especially with Chinese herbs, because it'll be pattern specific. But a lot of times, depending on the pattern, I highly recommend working with a Chinese trained herbalist, because the way we look at the pet is that the patterns are going to distinguish where those imbalances are. Do we have food stagnation? Those will be very different Chinese herbal formulas. Um, what else is going on? Once again, it comes back to and ties into everything that we're talking about, um, you know, looking for those imbalances. So IBD is a symptom. It doesn't tell me why IBD is there. Inflammatory bowel disease. What it tells me is the bowel is inflamed and it's a disease. So something had to happen for us to get to a place where now the bowel is not healing itself of the inflammation. It's usually an autoimmune disease. There's lots of inflammation. That's why they have GI upset, all those things. This is where the power of food therapy can change a pet's life. We recently brought in a, a new pet parent into our community and her dog was just diagnosed with IBD and they wanted to use prescription foods, put them on all the steroids and drugs. She had used some of the drugs previously. The dog was having acid reflux and then would have diarrhea, wasn't feeling good, lots of anxiety, hyperreactive. And it was a two-year-old dog. She was like, I can't have them on a prescription diet and all these drugs for the rest of their life. Simply using food therapy principles, changing the diet, using herbs that are going to help calm. So things like meadowsweet, chamomile, licorice, 
very soothing, calming, slippery elm, marshmallow root. Those are going to calm and soothe the inflammation. And while you're using food that's going to be more easily digestible um, and start healing leaky gut while we're waiting for other test results, already within a week, that mm -hmm. dog is feeling better. So this is where there are a lot of like there can be multifactorial reasons for why things happen. This is why we do the testing because it does make the process easier, but you can use these principles of the herbs and the food based on the symptoms that you're seeing to help heal those imbalances. Um, we do have a YouTube video on acid reflux on my YouTube channel, Dr. Katie Woodley, the natural pet doctor. If you're having trouble find it, please reach out to us um, at the natural pet doctor. Um, so you can send an email to us or you can search my name. Also, it'll pop up. We have a lot of free gut health resources and videos along with supplements and blogs and dosages that you can use. Keeping in mind, thinking about why is this here? Why am I using this supplement? What needs to be healed for why this symptom is here? That's how I approach my patients. Next question. Can a 12-year-old dog have diarrhea with mucus approximately once every month just from stress? All the tests test all fine. She eats ever more and is maintaining weight. A hundred thousand percent stress can lead to leaky gut. So even though Innovative Pet Lab test comes back normal, keep in mind the fact of just being stressed will send a signal to your gut that actually creates inflammation. So this is why emotional health is commonly missed and is also so important that we address it. And this is also why I use a lot of teas or CBD or ashwagandha. We need to support those adrenals. We need to calm down the brain on fire, the neuroinflammation. And two, we need to treat ourselves because a lot of times that stress is because we're not taking care of ourselves. We cannot pour from an empty cup. So you are your number one advocate for your dog. It is so essential that you are taking care of yourself too. And I don't take that lightly. And it can be the hardest change that we make. Um, but I promise it is the most rewarding change that you can make and your pets will mirror that change. But there are a lot of things that you can do too to help them. I talk about this in the skin gut video that you have access to and will also be a part of day four, talking about weathering the storm, the emotional health things that we can do for our pets to help them um, because it can lead directly to leaky gut. Next question. My dog's on colostrum. I heard it's best to cycle it. Um, I would ask, why are you using colostrum? Do we have potentially an impairment of the like secretory IgA? So that's the local immune system. Um, with supplements, a lot of times they do better if we're not giving them every single day and we're taking a break. We call that post treating, pulse dosing. Um, so especially with things like milk thistle, um, they're not meant to be given like every single day. So colostrum, I haven't personally seen the research around like pulse dosing colostrum. My question would be you probably, unless there's like a genetic impairment um, with the immune system and we have a, like a deficient immune system. Um, and I believe that genes can be adjust, like manipulated through epigenetics, through the environment, through food. Um, so I, I believe that's about 10% of what's going on in your pet. Um, for a lot of conditions. And then the rest is environmental. So colostrum, I wouldn't see it as being needed all the time. It's essentially there to like give it a boost, support that local immune system, and then help heal the gut. And then you would come off of it. That's how I would look at using colostrum and how I use it with my patients. All right, let's do one more question and then that will finish for tonight. Should geriatric dogs be fed twice a day? Carrie, great question. It goes back to, it depends. Um, if your dog is doing well with once a day feeding, I am fine with you doing once a day feeding for that intermittent fasting. Um, geriatric dogs, so older dogs, so any dog older, and this will vary on size, but typically over 10 years of age, they usually have less digestive enzymes as they age, just like we do as people. 
So if we're starting to see GI issues, we need to support digestion more. We need to make sure, once again, all of the factors are being accounted for and go from there. So if your dog's doing really well with once a day feeding, fantastic, keep them on that. If they're doing better with twice a day feeding, keep them on that. Um, we do not want to create stress by changing the food. So if you have an older dog and they're like getting really stressed because they're only getting fed once a day now, I would see that as a detriment to their gut health and their overall health. Um, so that's how I personally, in my experience, approach that. All right. So tomorrow I will be back to answer your questions. So I know there are a lot of questions here. Um, so you can always drop those under uh, the the Q&A for tomorrow night. Show up live. I love engaging with all of you. I see you guys going back and forth. Make sure that you're checking out all of the videos. Uh, tomorrow is going to be all about optimal nutrition for a healthy canine gut. You're going to be hearing from my good friend and dear colleague, Dr. Judy Morgan, Kimberly Gautier, on how to transition your dog to a a fresh food diet. Dr. Susan is also going to be talking more about how food therapy can really support the body. So tapping into the power of Chinese medicine through food. Dr. Nick Thompson is going to talk about raw food diets, the myths around that, and top tips that you want to know. So tomorrow is going to be packed with a lot of useful tools that can help you. And especially if you're looking to transition or add in more fresh foods into your dog's life, definitely check those out. I appreciate all of you for being here. If you need additional resources or you're not sure where to find information or I reference something and you're not finding it, please reach out or check out our YouTube channel also too. There's a lot of free resources there on gut health from acid reflux to healing leaky gut. Um, but please reach out if there's any questions around that. Otherwise, we have two more nights together to answer your questions and two more days of awesome content to help your dogs thrive. So I can't wait to see you there. Thank you again for taking time out of your day to learn more, to grow, and to help your dogs be the most healthiest dogs possible. I'll see you guys all tomorrow. I'm Dr. Katie Woodley.